People neglected as children sometimes spend their whole life longing for love, chasing it, fighting for it, longing for it, and never having it. Not really. Because there's this huge maladaptation of feeling attracted to unavailable people. Now, people who are married and can't really be with you, but string you along, or people who flat out aren't into you, that's who I mean. And that neglect in childhood and the way your parents put you down, it makes you the perfect person for these unavailable partners to draw energy and self-esteem from. And in fact, they do. They take your energy and they take your self-esteem and they get to have those things for themselves. And you know why it works? Because you think this is love. You think you can make this work. My letter today is from a woman I'll call Becky, and she writes, Hi, Anna. I'm 53 years old. During the COVID lockdown, I had the chance to do some self-reflection and came to some hard truths. Got my pencil. I'm going to circle things I want to come back to on a second reading, but I'm just going to read through Becky's letter. Let's see what's going on and if I can help. I realized that my childhood had more of an impact on me than I thought. I feel a little silly writing to you as my childhood didn't involve a divorce, a parent taking off, etc. I was an only child and my parents stayed married. However, as I grew up, my father would frequently come up to my room and sit me down and tell me that I was in the way. This would usually follow my acting like a kid, playing too loud, leaving a toy out, or not wanting to go to church. I was also a sickly kid, and I remember him coming up to my room when I had pneumonia and telling me how much a pain in the ass I was. My mother let it happen. I'd tell her what he said, and she'd say I was exaggerating. I remember hearing my grandmother trying to convince my mother of how he was treating me, and she still didn't believe it. My parents argued frequently. I have a vivid memory of mom telling him she wanted to go back to work and he threw a glass coffee table into the TV. Oh dear. I ran downstairs when I heard the crash and he looked at me and said, I'll never forget this. You have ruined our lives. I was nine. He also punched me in the jaw when I was in high school. Oh dear. Over my life, I've had nothing but bad relationships. I'm divorced, I had serious relationships since then, but they all go the same way, more or less. I go into the relationship feeling confident and inevitably come, become all about the relationship. I don't set boundaries. I tolerate behavior I know other women wouldn't. In one relationship, I never met his family or friends, and he had a meltdown when I surprised him for a visit. But I stayed with him. I finally ended it a year later when I just couldn't stand it anymore. I tend to gravitate toward men who are unavailable for one reason or another. They're either emotionally unavailable or jerks who want a woman who doesn't put up a fuss. I fit that mold, I admit it, but I have never gone down the path that I'm on now. I met someone on, so on a social media site. He's married. We began chatting often and became closer. Now there's some sexting, etc. Sexting, etc. I don't know what the other thing is. The thing is, he spends half our time talking about me, asking what I do, my life, etc. It's not as if he's just about the virtual sex. He sends messages when he knows I have a doctor's appointment or something going on. He shifts his schedule around so we can talk. But married. Yes, he says he and his wife live in separate rooms and are staying together for the kid who's 15. But they all say that from what I've heard. What's making this harder for me is that he does spend so much time asking about my life and wanting to know more about me. There are times we go days without virtual sex and just talk. I guess maybe you could call this an emotional affair on his end. Whatever the term, it's an affair and it's wrong. I know this, but at the same time, I can't remember the last time someone was so genuinely interested in my life. And that's hard to walk away from. I know most of my issues are rooted in childhood, just that knowledge alone has changed me, but I feel like I'm in the middle of the ocean. I've left behind the person I was, but I'm so far from the woman I know I can be, and part of me wonders if it's too late to change. So I guess my question is twofold. How do I end this, quote, relationship, and is it too late to change my thinking and my behavior? Okay, Becky, I got you. I, I know I can help. Let's go through what you told me. So you're 53 
and uh, you have been facing reality about the effect that your childhood had on you. Um, and you sort of say, well, I feel a little silly writing to you because my parents were still married, but your dad punched you in the jaw and threw a, a table into the TV and kept telling you over and over again, this is all your fault. You ruined our lives. You don't need, <laughs> it's weird. I think you need this validated. You were abused. You were abused, Becky. That's a terrible thing to say, and it's not just physically abusive, it's emotionally abusive. To keep telling a kid that they're not wanted, that they're a mistake, is a terrible thing to do. How great it would have been if they had gotten divorced, because maybe you could have been protected from some of this. I'm so sorry your mom let it happen. She said you were exaggerating. That's a lot of times what abused partners do, and it's terrible. I, you know, there's just no excuse for it, but it's common. It is common, so I assume she was... Um, she was involved in being abused as well and that her behavior comports with that. I think also like when a man is hurting your children or when anybody is hurting your children, that you either have to take bold measures to cut that person out of your life and maybe call the cops, or you have to find a way to gloss over it and rationalize to yourself that it's actually fine. And that's what so many people here have gone through. Their parents didn't stand up for them. Their parents just were in a fog of denial about what was going on. And occasionally they apologize later, but the damage is done, right? May it never happen to anybody else again. Sadly, we just know it's common and it is likely to happen to people. So you, they argued frequently he broke the, he threw the coffee table into the TV, punched you. And then you said in your life, you've had nothing but bad relationships. You got divorced. You've had serious relationships since then, but they always go the same way that you go in confident. That's, that's really cool. So you're capable of being confident you. That's, that's your reference point and inevitably become all about the relationship. That is the trauma wound. With the insecurity just completely stuck in your face again and again by your dad and your mom's non-reaction to that, I'm not surprised at all that you become all about relationships. That is a deep primal need to feel safe when you're a kid, when at, at any age, but when you're a kid especially, you're gonna end up programmed to find security at any cost. And that's, that's where that comes from, that just tolerating terrible treatment. So you said, um, with this one relationship, you never met family and friends, so you surprised him for a visit, which I would say is, um, it sounds like you had a an, an very understandable ulterior motive, which is to see what the hell's going on with this guy, and he had a meltdown, which means something was going on, but you stayed with him uh, for a year, okay? And then you tend to gravitate towards men who are unavailable. You know what I love about you is you understand that you gravitate to them. What I hear so often from people is they believe that despite anything they're doing, they attract people like that. And it feels like a mystery. That's also a very common trauma symptom, but you are, you are somewhere along the journey towards healing here because you're just like, I gravitate towards, there it is. There is the nature of your problem. You don't even have to know why. We know it has to do with your childhood, but you know that you do it. And the solution is going to be in countervailing against that tendency, putting up guardrails on yourself so that you have to check in with reality and you have to remember what your values are as you go into that unconscious state called courtship, right? When everything's like great and you're falling in love and it's so easy to just go, I don't know. I think I see a problem, but I won't look, <laughs> right? So now you're doing something, it's like further down the path for you. You met somebody on a social media site and he's married. And I think what you're saying is you guys have never met up in person. So that right there, you know, that what that tells me, the, you know, the unavailability is, is essential for you to be able to open up your heart. And so here's somebody, he's nice to you, but the part that works for you is that he doesn't exist in your physical world, right? Like right now where you are in your healing, you can't deal with somebody actually being a real person who's into you. That's okay, that's normal, and it can be healed, but that's what's going on. It's not like a mystery. It's that for you, that mystery feeling of like, I'm falling in love, I'm really attracted, you know, that, that mystery feeling, it just comes in and gets your brain. It happens for those of us who were, who were abused and neglected as kids on wrong people where it matches something about the, the past. And that unavailability is the thing that is eroticized. That is what is exciting. 
and we don't want to admit it, we can't admit it, it's not really what we want, we go through a lot of pain that they won't be with us, right? But that's what it is, it's eroticized abandonment and rejection. So what you love about this guy is he spends half the time talking about you, asking what you do, um, and you know, so you're saying it's not just about the virtual sex, and I would just venture to say, it is just about the virtual sex, and um, he would not be doing this to you if he really cared about you, is involving you and wrapping you up and seducing you. So somebody who wants to have, you know, uh, an illicit affair or doing it online, who's going to do all the work of making it happen, they are likely to use strategies that they're picking up from what you say. And probably a person does not have to get to know you well to find out that you've never been loved properly, that you're sad because nobody ever asks you about your day, that you're by yourself with that, that people have let you down in that department. So, you know, I'm just going to tell you, like, that's a really easy in for somebody to go in and say, I'm asking you about your day, I'm caring about you. But I just want to repeat, somebody who is tying up all your emotional energy so that they can take it while they're married is not your friend. They are not your friend. They are not caring for you. They are deceiving you and they're deceiving, they're deceiving their wife. And yes, yes, the story about how it's so unhappy, etc., but they still live together. Um, it's the oldest story in the book. All right. There's just lots of this out there. Anybody who wants to can have an affair with a married person who plays this game. And so for some people, the foreplay is going to be some kind of sexual thing. For some people, it's going to be, how was your day? Did your doctor's appointment go okay? <gasps> oh, that's what makes your trust fly open. I go, there, I trust you. You can be in my life. So I'm just... You, you sent it to me and I think you know this on some level and you knew I was going to call it out and be like, this is not love. And it's also, by the way, not an emotional affair. It's more than that. But yes, it includes emotional affair. And just because you guys have never met, it's a sinister kind of thing where, yeah, with phone sex, it is a physical affair. I mean, how would anybody feel if they caught their spouse doing this, right? If you're in a monogamous relationship, this would be devastating to the relationship. It's a terrible betrayal. And I'm just calling you out, Becky, you're part of the betrayal. Even if you've never met this woman, even if you want to believe she's as bad as he says, you are hurting her. And when you do that, you know, I'm not, I'm not like this huge believer in karma, but I just know for a fact, if you go around hurting people, your life is not going to go well. It's not going to go well. If you want to have a happy relationship, you have to be a person who supports, endorses, and upholds other people's relationships so they can be happy too. You can't steal this from people and be happy. It never works, all right? Okay, so he asks about you. And so it's hard for you to leave because you don't have anybody like that in your life right now. So that's really the problem right now is you don't have anybody in your life who cares how your day went or how, you know, they know that you went to the doctor. You are cut off. I don't know where your the status of your female friendships are, but I'm just going to say front and center female friendships. I know women can be difficult to be friends with when you grew up and your mom betrayed you. I know that's hard, but it's time for you to start. As a straight woman, your female friends are people who can love you and care about your day and be there with you and hang out on Saturday. And you do not have to contort yourself into somebody who tolerates terrible stuff from a guy. And that's a very simple rule, but I tell it to everybody again and again. Make friends, have friends who you can see on Saturday night. If you don't have friends, one really good place to start is in 12-step meetings. I talk about them a lot, but they're, you know, they're there in most communities. If you can't find them in person, you can find them online. I do think that seeing people in person is vital. It's really important, but starting online is a good thing. And there you can get a little recovery to uh, figure out how you're going to find real life friends in your life. I just want to give this pitch about 12-step recovery. Go to six different meetings to see which one's for you or if that, if that particular 12-step focus is for you, like if it's Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous or ACA, Adult Children of Alcoholics and Other Dysfunctional Families, or for anybody who, you know, if you have a problem with alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's the bomb, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, Debtors Anonymous. There's a lot of fellowships where people come together for the purpose of supporting each other in healing. And heal, they do. Now, if you go to those meetings, you might have a bad experience and go, well, I met this one person and he hit on me or this other person was really mean. Well, of course, 
if you go into any human gathering, there's going to be some of that. And especially if the human gathering is of people who are very, very wounded. So that's why if you really want to heal, you become vigilant about who are the people who are really working a 12 step program. And is there a woman who you really like what she has and you would like her to mentor you in the 12 steps and ask her if she will sponsor you. And if she says yes, then don't beat around the bush. Just find out how she teaches people to do what she did. There's no money involved. Nobody can sleep their way to the top here. So it's really about like you find people willing to show you how they did it. And then you take their advice to the best of your ability. And if you realize, oh, I don't like this person, you very politely end that sponsorship relationship and then find another one. It's so important to have a sponsor and to have somebody to show you how to do it. A lot of people go and just hang out or, you know, their therapist says, oh, you can go there and use it as a support group. But that's not really what it is. It's a it's a collection of people who are there to work the 12 step program and they support each other in doing that. So if you go to a meeting and everybody's just sitting around talking about problems of the day and they're not talking about the program of recovery, I would recommend keep going, find a different meeting. There's not going to be a lot of progress there. And I've, I've, I've been to 12 step meetings, thousands of them, you know, for like 25 plus years. And so I know the pattern and that's that you, you're going to, you, you can't help but heal when you're around people who take it seriously. So I wish you luck with that. So your question, how do I end the relationship? So what you do is you send a note, don't have a, you know, voice chat or anything, nothing like that. And just say, I've been thinking about it and working on myself. And I realize this relationship is really not um, healthy for me. I need to end it. I wish you the best. Goodbye. Boom. And in this case, block. In this case, you owe this person nothing. And uh, blocking is how you're going to avoid seeing them and dealing with them, trying to persuade you to come back and keep giving them free energy, you know, to make their marriage exciting, which is basically what's going on there. So the second thing is, is it too late? Not at all, but it, it will go on and on. Your pattern of doing this will only go on and on. What you've got here is sometimes with people, I sort of will say, you know, this looks like a real love addiction. And in your case, I think it might be something a little between that and just standard, um, unavailable, avoidant, you know, attraction to unavailable people as a means of avoidance, as a very fancy way to be in avoidance and to kick up an emotion of longing. I think longing is kind of your thing. And um, that's my guess, you know, from a distance from the little that you told me. And so longing is not good for you. If you can't have the person, if they are not, if they cannot be with you, they're not a good person. And so your job is to learn how to shut the door and be like, I feel sad. This, I really was hopeful that something good was going to come of this, but it didn't. And now I'm back at square one. But remember, you never go backwards when you end an unhealthy relationship. You actually just take, that's a big step forward. You've just moved forward to emotional availability, right? And being able to meet somebody who is totally into you and cares about your day. You're going to have to grow into the woman who can handle that. All right. And you do that. That's not going to happen by itself. It's not going to happen because you meet the right guy, which is, you know, that's an easy thing to believe. And we all have at times. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't fix it. So the, the, the wound that you're carrying around from childhood, people go, you need to heal your trauma. And they say that like, it's so easy. It's not so easy, but if you know, if you have tools that actually help you deal with the trauma symptoms so that you can stay clear headed, you can start to make very different choices in your life. I think the hardest thing about having complex PTSD is that right when you're having to make crucial decisions, like, should I answer the phone? Should I reach, should I respond to this person who reached out to me online? Even though I know something's wrong here, when you're making those crucial decisions, it sort of pushes you into a dysregulated trauma minded state. And you can end up making decisions that are completely against what you want or your best interest. And loneliness is the fuel. Loneliness is like gasoline on the fire. You know, that just, has pushed so many of us towards our worst decisions. So you need to have friends who hold your hand and are there at the other end when you text them and go, I feel like I have to call this guy again. And I know he's not right for me. In my dating course, you might want to take that. It, it begins with you write down, you write down all the qualities that you really want in a partner. And you would have a category of must have, like not negotiable, and then super important, but possibly negotiable, and then nice to have, right? And you get all that on paper. And that starts to inform you. And you look at it every day, especially if there's some guy showing up in your life. And you ask yourself, 
can I be honest with myself? Does this guy match what I'm looking for? And so one of the things that you may want to write down, I did, is cannot be involved with another woman. There's no entanglement. There's no ex living in the house. There's no drama going on with somebody. They are single. That is something that I really needed for myself because that had been such a problem in the past, among other things. And so you've got to, you've got to face reality. And I know, I know you because you're like me. You're going to think, I don't want to write these things down because they're so specific that I'll never get anyone. And trust me. Trust me, there's a super powerful effect that happens when you really like are honest with yourself about what you want. When you're honest with yourself, it can sort of start to direct your thoughts and direct your eyes and direct your heart towards something better for yourself than you've ever had before. And wouldn't that be nice to have? Yes, that would be nice to have. But to have it, you have to stop having this kind of thing. It has to like stop. You just stop it. And that's, that's how 53 is a fine age to do that. And many, many people make the change in their fifties, sixties, seventies, and later. I have, I always talk about my friend Gladys who met the love of her life in her eighties after her really horrible husband died. I had known her since I was a kid and I can agree he was a horrible husband and he died. And all she was sorry is that she didn't just move on so much earlier than she did. She thought she had to stick it out. So that's my story for you, Becky. If anybody watching wants to sharpen their skills to look out for romantic manipulation, it's very good to know how to do this. I've got a tip sheet for you. It's a PDF you can download right here. And I will see you very soon.